Development on The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom is now complete. When we got our first look at Tears of the Kingdom, we got our first look at gaming as a realistic art form, finally surpassing Half-Life 2 by giving us the prop gun. Then I scrolled to the comments and saw none other than top 10 YouTube person OSP Red say, I can hear every other open world game dev crying bitter tears about how hard it's gonna be to steal that fusion mechanic. And that got me thinking, how does this thing work under the hood? Obviously I can't know for sure, I don't have source code access, but you know what? Heck it, I'll give it my best guess and say that this fusion mechanic wouldn't be tough to copy at all. Because we have a little thing called inheritance. It's a foundational concept in modern programming, and it is exceptionally easy to visualize in games. And now is the time where everybody who's not a programmer goes, huh? and everybody who is a programmer goes, Dude, this is like the third thing that you would learn. To explain inheritance, let's say we have a script called MAN. We want this script to do three things. Say, scream, cry, and drink to cope. This script is a class, all of its own, and has these three methods. But what if you want another script called baby that can do all the same things, but with a few differences, maybe an extra thing it can do, or it prefers Hennessy over Merlot? Well, we make this new baby class inherit from man. This gives baby access to all the things that its parent man can do, and lets us add other things on top of it without changing the base man. Say we want the baby crying to do something different to its parent, but everything else remains the same. We say override cry and write a new method. Now the baby uses that override if it wants to cry, but defaults to its parent class if it needs to do the other methods. This centralizes your code for fewer points of failure, so how does that tie into Tears of the Kingdom? We have our base class of weapon. This contains things that every weapon needs. If collision box overlaps, deal damage. If the durability is zero, break. Then we step down a level and start to subdivide into the weapon types. One-handed, shields, two-handed, spears, and bows. This has details like which animations to play, which buttons trigger them, which inventories they get sorted into. Since it inherits from weapon, all of these new classes still have that necessary baseline. Then we subdivide further into individual weapons. This has their damage, their durability, whether or not they burn, whether or not a bow will zoom in, whether or not your heavy blade will cause lightning strikes. So when we want to know how a single weapon works, we end up with how all weapons work, how this family of weapons works, and how this specific weapon works. This hierarchy means that if you want to add a new weapon, you don't need to define weapons in general or define their family, you just need to come up with how this specific one differs from the base. And in Breath of the Wild, that's where it ends. But how do we get fusing to work here? That's as simple as adding another detail to the lowest class what we'll call the fused script. Every acceptable target for fusion, be it a rock, a weapon, a fish, has this fused script to dictate what it does when fused. Wanna fuse a rock onto a stick? The rock's fused script modifies damage and durability when it's added, and that's basically the end of it. Spear to spear? We've got rules that modify hitbox data to combine the base weapon with the hitbox attached to the fused script. Homing arrows? Geese eyeballs have an override to update that searches for a target, then eases the arrow's direction to point towards that target. The key is to keep everything as generic as possible so that things can slot together as easily as possible. This is what differentiates the labor required for unique sprites on every Pokemon fusion. Don't look at me like that. Down to a simple set of modifiers that can apply to anything. So if this is so easy, why hasn't it happened yet? Breath of the Wild had a massive impact on the open world game space, so why is its direct sequel the only thing to come up with this idea? Well, because even if we minimize the labor this way, it's a goddamn scope nightmare. This fusion mechanic isn't a hard thing to implement, but it is a lot to implement. This is a feature that could only exist in a sequel that already has a bunch of assets laying around to reuse, and in an art style that accommodates physics rocks and logs like these using the same models repeatedly. If you have to come up with new resources, their impacts on crafting recipes, and something for them to do if you strap them to your balls and get wedgie, no, you can't balance that. You can't coherently introduce that to your players in a single game. But if we already have these assets lying around, and we already have players who understand the foundations of the system, we find more room in the budget, 
and more time that the players are willing to put towards learning it, huh? Yeah, you see what I'm doing here? You see? This means that Tears of the Kingdom is very uniquely equipped to implement a mechanic like this for practical and stylistic reasons. So, while it wouldn't be completely out of the question for Horizon's Nebulous front butt to do this, we have to ask the question, should it? Zelda is no stranger to things that look a little stupid. From the dongo inflation to a flail twice the mass of your own body to unlimited slap works, Zelda's tone accommodates the goofs, which very few of the open worlds it influenced cared to notice. So I am beyond excited to embrace the nascent silliness of Hyrule and yeet myself off of Skyloft. Let's go! Anyways, I'm cutting this short because I want to go play Tears of the Kingdom and put this video out before it's completely irrelevant. This is my dog. Comment and subscribe for my dog. Bye!